Today we're going to be talking about the history of environmental education in the U.S. To do this, we want to answer some questions, like, what are the origins of environmental education? How has it changed over time? Is diversity reflected in environmental education? What needs to be improved? The history of environmental education starts much earlier than the time of Thoreau and Emerson. Some people attribute its beginnings to philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who believed that education should be centered around the environment back in the mid-1700s. Or, a little later, biologist Louis Agassiz, who thought people should study nature, not books. These people laid the foundation for what really began as environmental education in the United States around the 1960s through 1970s. To start, in 1970, IUCN defined environmental education as the process of developing skills and attitudes necessary to understand the interrelatedness among men, his culture, and his biophysical surroundings. Environmental education focuses on different subject areas like ecology, economics, or philosophy. The Stockholm Conference in 1972 was a major turning point in recognizing the importance of conservation and the need to make a change in how we impact the environment. With this came the recognition for the growing need of environmental education. In 1980, several environmental groups such as the IUCN and the WWF started an initiative called the World Conservation Strategy. This strategy focused on a plan for sustainable development but also stressed the importance for environmental education. It said that the long-term task of environmental education is to foster or reinforce attitudes compatible with a new ethic. In the 1990s, grassroots scholars began to focus on literature and rhetoric that appeared in poetry, fiction, and nonfiction genres. During this time frame, it was common to read pieces that highlighted one's place within nature, such as local versus bioregional thinking. For transcendentalist authors Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, their places in nature are reflected through ideas of how man directly connects to the environment. Wake Forest English professor Dr. Madeira says that she continues to teach these authors because each of them has what I'd call a foundational weight since they are caught up in different movements we associate with American individualism and environmental thought. When you're presenting Thoreau or Emerson, you're having to evaluate convoluted descriptions that dramatize nature to be romantic and fantastical. These authors give us a literary starting point to analyze our relationship with nature through philosophy, ethics, and consumerism. They are so drastically unique from any other canonical time within American literature and therefore add value to our education and literary canon. However, focusing so much on these authors and other white men leaves us in a dangerous position. North Carolina Central Earth and Geospatial Science professor Dr. Christopher Zarzar took a look at his curriculum and noted that all these folks are men, and for the most part, are white, or at least of some European descent. Like, Raj Patel is like the one person who is really focused on environmental justice, and food mm -hmm. justice, and approaching it from that angle. And his arguments and ideals have some extremely powerful, and, and they resonate. And I was sad to see my list had very few other authors that can resonate in that kind of environmental justice thing. And when we look at those who are facing the damages of these issues, it's more than likely to be those who are from marginalized backgrounds. When it comes to climate change in particular, the aesthetics and ethics between local and bioregional scales become blurred when the globe itself is experiencing an environmental fever. The sciences call for persuasion with facts, while the humanities are shifting into applied socio-cultural skills to help create progress towards climate change. Thus, environmental justice is born to help meld the two disciplines together, where the romanticism of nature is supported with the facts. Environmental justice, a relatively newer field within environmentalism that focuses on the intersectionalities of social backgrounds with environmental issues, aims to raise voices of oppressed communities. Giving voices to marginalized groups and fighting for equity is the goal, but in order to do this, we also need to hear and learn from them their cultures, their perspectives on the environment, and how they've been negatively affected by global issues that they weren't the culprits of. Dr. Zarzar acknowledged that. I mean, that's, that's so true about environmentalism itself is it is whitewashed and it's it ties into this kind of like network of not trying to seek out new voices and just continuing with, continuing with those voices that fit into your narrative. This is something that needs to be fixed immediately within environmental education. 
When talking to Dr. Madeira about her perspective on diversity in environmental education, she noted that it is important to recognize that we can benefit from a broader scope of ecological understanding from indigenous peoples, the global south, and the non-Western world. Learning from these diverse perspectives provides us with more information and a better understanding of the environment and environmental justice. We're able to develop ways to be empathetic with each other, which will help forward solutions towards climate change that are representative of everyone. The beauty of environmentalism today is that activists are culturally diversified, well-educated interdisciplinarily, and surprisingly young. Are we able to make this picture canon in environmental curriculums? Dr. Zarzar spoke of the necessity of students to look inward and deconstruct their own sphere of influences that have shaped their thinking. In doing so, it becomes apparent how Western European perspectives, religion, and colonization have dramatically altered our view of and relationship with the environment. In his environmental courses, he also chooses to teach a formal module centered around environmental justice and environmental racism. Firstly, we must recognize the inconceivable loss of original environmental history through colonization of indigenous peoples. There is a forever setback in the Western world, as we will never be able to learn of environmental practices that once cultivated nature around us. We need to listen and learn from the many Native American environmentalists of today, such as Wainuna Duke, who provide us with a unique and direct perspective on environmentalism in our country. There are many other people we should be making efforts to include in our curriculums in order to expand our perspectives. For example, Rachel Carson, a female scientist during the 60s who was able to expose the impacts of DDT in ecological perspective. Chico Mendes was an environmental and human rights activist in Brazil who promoted preservation of the Amazon rainforest, as well as unionizing indigenous laborers who worked in the rubber industry or Wangari Matai, the Kenyan environmental and political activist who has written a number of books on topics of environmental justice. Environmental education has adapted with a changing world, but has failed to catch up in this regard. 